Now, CNN's Anderson Cooper on assignment for 60 Minutes. The mountain gorilla may just be the world's most magnificent animal, but there are only about 700 of them left, and conservationists genuinely fear the entire species might become extinct. Last year, when we first broadcast this report, at least 10 mountain gorillas had been shot to death. This year, there's no telling how many have been killed because a civil war in Congo has kept park rangers from getting to most of that country's gorillas. Mountain gorillas live in Central Africa in a forest that straddles Rwanda, Uganda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a family of gorillas was massacred last summer. We went to Congo, a desperately poor country, to see why those gorillas were slaughtered, why the surviving gorillas are in jeopardy, and what could be done to save them. They act tough, but mountain gorillas are really gentle giants. Playful, peaceful, and highly intelligent. One of our closest animal relatives. They live in families, each headed by an adult male called a silverback because of its distinctive coloring. Over the years, they've been gradually introduced to people so scientists can study them. Taught that people won't hurt them. But this year, in Congo, humans have betrayed them. Mountain gorillas are under attack. They're extremely threatened in Congo. Threatened to the extent that we're worried about the survival of the whole population. Um, the, the, the whole population could, could the whole be wiped population out. Could be destroyed, could be wiped out. Dr. Emmanuel Demarode heads a non profit group called Wildlife Direct, which helps pay the salaries of Congo's park rangers who protect the gorillas. He was with the rangers in July when they made their most gruesome discovery finding the bodies of four gorillas who'd been slaughtered in the dead of night. It was a, a terrible, terrible scene to witness. It was our whole lives, everything we were working for, that was shattered in front of us. The dead gorillas were part of the Rugendo family, filmed earlier this year. They were the first gorilla group introduced to humans. We had spent time with that group, and there was, in many ways, a, a strong sense of trust. And, and you found a female named Safari first? Yes. She was quite famous in many ways because she had just had a baby and we had taken a photo in the days after she was born and that photo had been, you know, a real symbol of hope for us. And then to find her dead and her baby nowhere to be seen was, was gutting for all of us. And she'd been shot? She'd been shot twice through the chest and then they'd poured fuel on her and set her alight. What was the scene like? There was a very, very strong smell, which for all of us will always remain. It went right through your clothes, it went to the back of your throat. It was everywhere, and it stayed with us physically for days afterwards. The next day, they found the body of the family's leader, a giant silverback named Sinquekwe. We think he may have been shot and then chased into the forest. He had several bullet wounds through his chest. Had you ever seen anything like that? No, I, I hadn't, thankfully. Nothing prepares you for the horror of a whole group that's been massacred. He calls it the worst day of his life, and so do the park rangers. Augustine Kambale couldn't believe his eyes. I was thinking that I'm in a dream. And still now, I, it continued to, to move in my head. You still think about it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Still now, I don't understand why people can, can kill gorillas. In silence, rangers and villagers made stretchers and hoisted the gorillas onto their shoulders. They wanted, they say, to carry them out like kings. It's to show people that how this animal is very, very important. You wanted to show the people yeah, that yeah, you respect yeah, them exactly, like a king. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So why were these kings assassinated? Simply, it seems, for this, charcoal. More than a million people in this area, practically everyone, use charcoal to cook their food. It's made by burning the trees in the gorilla's forest. They cover mounds of wood with mud and set it on fire, turning the ancient trees into brittle bricks of charcoal. You can see the smoke from the air. Rob Muir of the Frankfurt Zoological Society took us for a tour. They're cutting down the forest. And, uh, and they're smoking it out, basically. And they will continue to move further and in, deeper into the forest, cutting down prime habitat. It's being carried away bag by bag, step by step. There it is, a train of charcoal carriers. You see it? Yeah, I don't see it. 
Women carry huge bags of charcoal for miles on their shoulders. Men wheel bigger loads to market on handmade wooden bikes. It's a multi-million dollar business, illegal but backed by powerful interests, businessmen, soldiers, corrupt government officials, a charcoal mafia. When rangers try to stop the destruction of the forest, Rob Muir says the charcoal mafia killed the gorillas to warn the rangers to back off. In June, a female gorilla was found, killed, a bullet to the back of her head, um, execution style. They want to intimidate and scare the Congolese Wildlife Authority. The message was, if you don't stop, we can kill all the gorillas. But the rangers refused to stop. Continued, even upped their campaign to try and dismantle the charcoal production. And then a month later, Rogendo family was decimated. I'm sure the charcoal mafia were behind this. How do you solve the charcoal problem? They're all using charcoal. They have no other source. How do you get around that? Provide alternative fuel. Butane, for example. But butane requires special stoves. And buying that equipment for every family would cost tens of millions of dollars. So it would need to be subsidized. I mean, we desperately need uh, donors, the EU, the World Bank, someone like that to really come in and say, hey, we've got some money here. You know, we appreciate this is urgent. We, you know, if we don't act now, we could lose the gorillas. Muir says two babies were orphaned this summer when charcoal makers killed their mothers. One baby was found clinging to its dead mother's corpse. The other had been pulled to safety by an older brother, but was starving without its mother's milk. Rangers rescued both orphans, and vets are still trying to nurse them back to health. Have you ever seen these mountain gorillas as under threat as they are now? Never. Never. I don't think, I don't think they have ever been as threatened as they are currently today. Just how threatened? No one knows, because the rangers haven't been able to see Congo's gorillas for more than three months now. Almost 200 mountain gorillas live here in the Congo, along the forested slopes of that volcano. The problem is there are more than a half dozen armed rebel groups fighting government forces in and around those forests. And the rangers who protect the gorillas have had to flee. That means Congo's entire population of mountain gorillas is now left unprotected, and they're caught in the middle of a civil war. So the gorillas right now are, are cut off. You cannot get to them. No. no. They can no. shoot no. them. No. They can uh, no. be uh, in traps. We no. can't know, we don't know the situation we of our no. gorillas. The gorillas can get caught in the crossfire. Yeah. yeah. Congo may be a dangerous country for gorillas, but it's even deadlier for people. There's been fighting here for more than 10 years, and more than 100 rangers have been killed. At a ranger's post outside the park, their sign is pockmarked with bullet holes. Over 300 rebels would surround a patrol post during the night and just shoot it to hell. Heavy artillery bombing Why? With, with no care for human life. And they're after the ranger's equipment, ammunition, rifles. They see the rangers as a soft target. So rangers are, are outnumbered, outgunned? Completely. Completely. This is probably the most dangerous park on the planet. So dangerous that all the rangers can do now is gaze at the forest from afar and hope for a ceasefire. But in that same forest, just a few miles from the fighting, across the borders in Rwanda and Uganda, the rest of the mountain gorillas are safe for the moment, though they face yet another threat. There are so few of them that Ebola or some other deadly virus could wipe them out. It's a tough trek to get to Rwanda's gorillas, but it is an extraordinary experience. We're on our way to a family of 21 gorillas headed by an adult male silverback the park rangers call Agasha. Trackers have already gone up ahead of us and found Agasha's family. They've radioed back to the exact location. Now we just have to hike up and find them. It can take from 20 minutes to four hours to find the gorillas. The forest is dense, the trail muddy. <laughs> As we reach Agasha's family, our guides grunt like gorillas to assure them we come in peace. <coughs> While it's impossible not to be impressed by the size of the gorillas, Agasha weighs more than 400 pounds, they didn't seem too impressed by us. They spend their days eating bamboo and other plants and the occasional mound of termites. Agasha eats up to 60 pounds a day. He needs the energy. He has 11 adult females in his family and tries to mate with each of them every day to keep them from wandering off. This female is pounding her chest, trying to get Agasha's attention. 
The Silverback seemed unconcerned by our arrival, but he did want to make sure we knew who's boss. Twice, when he thought we'd gotten too close, he charged right past our cameras. Mountain gorillas seem to have a sense of humor and like to stare at those who stare at them. Gorilla see, gorilla do. You're only allowed one hour with gorillas to limit their risk of catching a disease. Poachers are another problem. Two gorillas in this family have lost a hand because of snares. Even in Rwanda, poachers set snares, usually to catch antelope, but gorillas get trapped in them too. A fact which pains our guide, Olivier Nabonomona, who feels the gorillas are a national treasure. We really love these gorillas because they need, they deserve this right to, to, to survive. Also, they bring money in the country, then it helps in poverty reduction. In Rwanda, gorilla tourism has created jobs for guides, handicraft makers, and hotel workers. Each visitor pays $500 to see the gorillas. Rwanda will make $6 million from tourists this year. Part of that money goes to villagers who live right next to the park to convince them that protecting the gorillas and the forest can enhance their lives too. The government has installed 10 new water tanks so villagers don't have to walk miles to get clean water. They've also built a new health clinic, new schools, and planted thousands of new trees. But back in Congo, all that's new are the graves of Sinkwekwe and Safari and the other mountain gorillas killed this year. They're buried outside the forest. It's still too deadly for park rangers to return to Congo's side of the forest to find out what's happened to the animals they feel they can talk to. When you are together them, you will see that they have some um, sounds. Do you speak gorilla? Mm, I can speak yeah, some gorilla. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah I can. I speak yeah. some gorilla. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> means that that is something which is not going uh, well here. So much is not going well here. Charcoal, civil war, poachers, disease, and all of it is threatening these gentle giants these last few kings of Congo. Last March, authorities arrested a high-ranking park ranger who'd been director of the park where the five gorillas were slaughtered and charged him with orchestrating the massacre. His alleged motive? To keep his fellow rangers from breaking up the illegal charcoal trade still flourishing in the gorillas' forest.